Well, good evening, and uh, James has earned his pint of foaming London pride by plugging my book, and I'm very grateful. Um, it's a funny old game, this Austrian school economics. Um, if ever I'm, in a t if I'm at a posh dinner party and I say, uh, I happen to mention or I'm asked that I'm an Austrian school economist, and people say, the, the normal response is, oh, are they getting it right in Austria? Uh, that's their general knowledge of it. And of course, if it was in the Yorkshire pub, and I mentioned Austrians, Austrian economics, they normally say, I didn't know they spoke Austrian. And that's the kind of response that you get from this particular school of economics, which is a bit sort of secret, really. And yet, if you think about it, uh, Austrian school economics is actually just applied common sense. That, that, that's all it is. And of course, it's probably the reason that it's been shoved into a little bit of a corner is because one thing the world doesn't seem to welcome these days is common sense. Uh, they don't seem to like common sense at all. And we see that almost in every regard every day. Now, if I sometimes have to sort of try and explain it in seconds to somebody who is only mildly interested uh, and doesn't know much about it, I say, well, really, Austrian school economics, in short, is that if you want an Austrian school economy, you don't want anything to do with the state, politicians or bureaucrats. You'd like to sweep the entire thing away because they are the problem. And that manif manifesting itself at the moment more than ever. Almost every problem today faced by you or your families are caused by politicians. If you do the audit trail back and find out what's going wrong, why it's going wrong, you'll find political policies somewhere at the end of it. Uh, and that's something uh, that you have to build the bricks on to explain or introduce Austrian school economics. That is the state is the problem and that's a state that we need to get rid of in very large measure other, and, and release the people. And a little bit later, in uh, perhaps in q and I don't know, I've got some quotes here from Lord Salisbury, uh, whose government was probably one of the most successful conservative governments in the late 19th century. Uh, it's hot stuff, so hot I was banned from Cambridge University from giving this particular lecture on the, Lord, the, the, the government of Lord Salisbury. The, the precious people at uh, the other place uh, we mustn't disturb their equilibrium. Uh, but um, it's quite interesting because Lord Salisbury didn't know it because Austrian school economics hadn't been invented, but he was actually an Austrian school economist. And I've got some fabulous quotes here to prove that. Now, I'm going to just use a bit of sort of anecdotal work here to get it, to, to sort of get it off the ground. Um, this relate our relationship with the state. It's difficult for those of you who are undergraduates here because you live in a glorious bubble. Um, and I, it's an understandable, it's a lovely bubble. It's the oldest university in, in, in the country, but it is a bubble nonetheless, an academic bubble. If you work in the public sector, it's difficult to understand or difficult to comprehend or empathise with the fact that lots of tax and lots of public sector jobs aren't a good thing because you're on the receiving end of it. So I'm going to just go through the life, if those of you uh, who haven't yet had this experience, uh, of how that actually manifests itself to the ordinary working Joe, the man on the Clapham omnibus, if you will. Uh, Joe Sixpack, the Americans would call him. Uh, and I was that man. Uh, not so much now as I'm old and croaky and nearly dead, but I used to be this particular man. I woke up, you know, in the morning. It doesn't matter whether you're going to a factory, incidentally, or, or it doesn't matter whether you're going to a factory or an office, whatever it happens to be. Um, in the wealth-creating sector, and the wealth-creating sector is almost everybody <clears throat> and anybody who isn't in the wealth-consuming sector. So your little girl who runs a small hairdressing salon is a wealth creator. Your prat at the town hall on a quarter of a million pounds a year with his index link pension is a wealth consumer. Some people in the Adam Smith Institute, by the way, don't actually understand that, uh, which is quite extraordinary. So you are either a wealth c consumer or you are a wealth creator. There are only two sorts of people. 
in, in an economic environment. So let, let, let's, let's take either me or this imagined individual. You wake up in the morning and you stare at the ceiling. The date is the beginning of April. Let's call it the 1st or 2nd of April. It's the end of the tax year is the point that I'm driving at. Not that it's all Fool's Day. Uh, it's the end of the, it's, it's the, end of the uh, financial year. You wake up and you stare at the ceiling. And of course, it's the end of the financial year. Your rates are due. Uh, and of course, for our American cousins, uh, it's property tax. It's property tax for us. We call it rates historically, and, uh, but it's, it's a property tax. It's a property tax. And in your modest villa, and I live in a modest villa, I know because the Daily Mail described it as a modest villa, um, uh, and my rates uh, are £2,500 a year. That's, so I wake up in the morning. I have done the, I haven't got out of bed yet. I stare at the ceiling. I'm down two and a half grand, for which we get nothing. We get our bins emptied. I live in a tiny little rural village, which isn't even on main drains. Uh, and we haven't had um, any of our extended family educated at the state's expense, I don't think, since about 1800. So we don't get anything from the state. We don't want anything from the state. But there I am, I'm looking at the ceiling and I've done two and a half grand. <clears throat> I get into the car, <clears throat> I get into my motor car, which is a nice new one. I only bought it yesterday. Absolutely marvellous, a typical family car. It's a Skoda Karok. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a super piece of kit. It's a family car. Um, it costs 30 grand. Six grand of that was VAT. So just bear that in mind. I'm now down two and a half grand in property tax and I'm down six grand for, uh, in VAT for yesterday's car. I fill the car up. And of course, as we all know, that costs about 60 or 70 quid. Over half of that goes to the government. Whoa, the government's come in again and they've nicked that. And I haven't even got to work. I haven't got to work yet. Uh, and I get to work and it's the end of the month. So it's payday. I look at my, uh, I look at my pay sheet. And what do I look at? Being an Englishman uh, in, in modern Britain, I don't even look at the left-hand side, all right? I don't even look at the left-hand side. That's meaningless to me, the left-hand side. The gross amount that I've been paid is of no interest to me. I look at the net when it's all been deducted on the right-hand side, because that's what's going into my bank account. Now, who's had their hand in the till? The government again. They've got PAYE, employer tax, which isn't even there on the left-hand side. It's been nicked before it even got onto the left-hand side. It's money that my employer would quite happily pay me, but he can't, it's, employ it's employ employer tax. And national insurance contribution, which of course, it is no such thing, it's another tax. So it's swallowed up by that's all taken into consideration. If you're an ordinary sort of middle England professional man, that's taken a third of my pay and that will take a third of my pay for the year. And I come back and the missus wants me to buy a new saucepan or something, there's VAT on that. So that's 20%, so there's a few quid there. I stop for a couple of pints, uh, and of course, most of that is duty uh, on your pint, that no, 50% on your pint. So we are taxed and taxed and taxed. And of course, uh, there's no serious audit trail. You know, we don't know where it goes. I mean, if you look at the car, look, look at the car, your petrol tax, your VAT on the vehicle itself, all that kind of thing. If you actually drill down and find out what they spend on roads and what they take from the motorist, um, uh, you're about, uh, I, I, did, I haven't done it for two years, but you're round about 40% light. You're 40% light. 40% disappears. So it's an unbelievably expensive place uh, to work and live in England at the moment and it all goes to the state and this is of course suppressing <clears throat> the economy because highly taxed economies uh, are the weakest economies is, 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 is the general rule. Now people say oh well the socialists will say to you well we need policemen and we need teachers and we need uh, we need all these things <clears throat> but I would put to you a different idea. Okay, let's run through that experience again. I would like to see a system where you can have um, an exemption card. An exemption card. It looks a bit like a gold card or a credit card or whatever it is. It's an exemption card. 
and your contract with the state is that you want nothing from it. I don't want anything from the state at all. I want the state to go away. Civil servants, politicians, I don't want, to, I don't want anything to do with the state at all in any way, shape or form. And I've contracted, I've signed that, and I've got my exemption card. Let's run through, let's run through my day with this exemption card. I wake up in the morning and I stare at the ceiling. There's no two and a half thousand pounds worth of rates because I'm exempt. I've done the deal. I'm exempt. I look down at my shiny new Skoda Karok uh, and I got that for 24 grand because I didn't pay any VAT because I'm exempt. I go to work. I fill up the car with petrol. Instead of it costing 70 or 80 quid now, it costs 30 quid. I get to work. Now, there isn't any left or right hand side, there's just one slip of paper telling me what I've earned. And if I earn £5,000 a month, I get £5,000. Simple as that. You see where this is going? And then I stop for my pint, and my pint is only a couple of quid. Uh, anything I buy, if I take the wife out, there's no VAT, there's no duty on the wine that my wife might drink, which is a saving that is very considerable, I don't know. <laughs> so, there is an enormous saving if you have this exempt card. And people say, well, what are you going to do for all the, the things that the state provide? Well, just think about that. Well, you don't need anything from the state. You now, you've got a whole bucket of money in your pocket. If you saved at least a third of your outgoings, and we're now in the highest tax, uh, we, we're now as highly taxed as we have been for the last 70 years, which you will probably know. Uh, so tax is going up. Uh, your services you get for it, I would argue, are going further and further down. And here you are freed up with a lot more money in your pocket. You don't need the health system. You're private. You've got enough money now, you're private. You and your family are buted up to the gunnels. So you don't need that, all right? Even if the, the, the NHS was actually working, which of course it isn't working. So, so you know, you're going to get seen by your, your GP who you pay, like I do mine, at Stonegate Medical. I phone him up and, and, and I say, I want to see you Friday at 10 o'clock and it's Friday at 10 o'clock. He doesn't muck me about. And when I get there, he does whatever he needs to do and all the rest of it there and he gives me a bill and I pay him, it's 80 quid. That's the way you do business in Austrian school and economics, all right? There's no middlemen, there's no diversity officers, there's no 50% of the entire 1.2 million employees in the NHS tossing it off. The only people at the hospital are nurses, doctors, radiologists, physiotherapists, right? They go, you've got rid of all these bloodsuckers, all right, because you're having a system that you actually pay for and it's lean and it's hungry and it works. So your health is improved. You've got your bupa. And of course, the money that you've saved for your education, the education of your son or your daughter, or this, is enough. Therefore, the saving is enough for you to send them to a private day school. Not Eaton wouldn't be enough for Eaton unless you were earning big bucks and your savings are even more. But you, it's a, a reasonably plausible private school. Uh, there are some very good state schools. Don't think I don't know that there are. But it's very much dependent upon your catchment area. And it's a little bit of it's, it's, it's whether it's luck. It's luck. You might be lucky. Uh, but generally speaking, that's not the way to bet. So you have then money for your educational system uh, and all that money is given back to you and of course you also have money in your pocket which is better for the economy and this is where um, Frederick Bastiat, have you come across Frederick Bastiat at all and I'm sure some of you have, uh, the French uh, 19th century economic philosopher uh, who says that the really good economist, the economist who really knows what he's doing is the guy who can spot the unseen, the unseen. So if you do this with your money, or the government takes tax and does this with your money, where would that money else gone elsewhere? Some of you will know this as the, the broken window uh, theory, that you give money to the glazier if you have a broken window and, and, and it sets off a whole chain of events. But this, where Frederick Bastiat gets this right is you've got to understand where would the money otherwise have gone. So uh, I've met people who think that, that the uh, American Depression uh, was broken by uh, them going to war, by World War, World War II. I mean, 
So that means, that, well, isn't it a very good idea if we build lots of tanks, lots of guns and bomb everywhere because everybody's then going to sort of rebuild it and everybody gets a job. I mean, there are people who believe that. And sadly, some of them still believe it and they're in, the, they're in Washington today. They're in Washington today. War is lovely if you don't have to go to it yourself. War is great in an armchair at your club. It's not so good if you're young enough to get drafted or conscripted. So there is this love of warfare, and this is one of the problems that the American economy has. It has a trillion dollar a year military budget. That's a trillion do dollars, which is borrowed. It's borrowed money, and that's taking money out of the economy. And of course, we have a come one all uh, welfare system in this country, which was never the intention. I'll just look at that for a moment. If you look at Beveridge uh, in, the, uh, in 1943 and what he was trying to achieve, uh, and uh, as an Austrian school economist, uh, I don't go with it, but I understand what he, where he was coming from it, and that is that the welfare system would be a safety net. It's a safety net for people who've fallen on hard times through no fault of their own. There was no conception in 1943 that it would be a lifestyle choice or it would be even open to anybody who hadn't bought their magical national insurance stamp because it was a takeover, if you will, from the mutual uh, and friendly societies of the, of the 18th and 19th century, which were wonderful and they were got rid of in the 1980s in a criminal act, uh, in a criminal act of neglect, where people... Uh, they put their one or two pence or three pence, whatever it was, a week into the friendly society. And if they fell on hard, hard times through no fault of their own, these people would be looked after by their own friendly societies as members, as members. It was neat, it was effective, it was not abused, and it preserved people's dignity. It wasn't charity. It wasn't charity. Friendly societies weren't charity. That was blown away in the early 1950s when it turned into a come one, come all, and there was no fund. Your national insurance stamp, of course, as you know, doesn't go into any fund. There is no fund uh, for your pension or your well-being or your social care. There is no fund. Uh, it's just, it just comes straight out of taxation. Uh, so these are the problems that we've got. We have all, across the pond in America, we have a massive warfare society. And if you look, and those of you who visited America, I'm sure lots of you have, it's almost, it's almost like the Prussian society uh, of the late 19th century. You know, boy, if you've got veteran, if you've got a veteran's card, everything's discounted, everything's free, it's absolutely wonderful, it's marvellous, uh, highly paid, uh, so on and so forth. But nobody ever asks what the point of it all is. Um, nobody's ever explained to me why you need, why the Americans need 11 aircraft carrier groups. It begs the question, who do they think is going to evade America? What, what's, you know, what, what's the point in all this military spending? And of course we have no system for suppressing or reining back or auditing to our own welfare system. So we have a warfare welfare kind of uh, axis, as it will, and I include Europe uh, in, in that as well, who, who are in the main no better. Some countries in Europe are better than us. The Germans run their national health system a lot better, for example. And if we're going to change a model, if we have to look at a model, uh, the German system, which is actually based very much on friendly societies and mutual societies, self-help uh, and, and a much tighter ship. So this is where, this is where Austrian school of economics is going, that we are much better you here tonight are much more capable of looking after you and your families than any politician or bureaucrat. And you've only got to look at them on the TV. I mean, some of them are frankly retarded, aren't they? I mean, do you honestly believe you can't make better decisions for you and your family than some of these characters? And of course, we all know that most of them are corrupt. How is it that when we know how much... Uh, an MP or we know how much a minister gets, we know where they are as far as a salary is concerned. How is it they always end up multi-millionaires? And it started way back with Edward Heath. Ocean racing, the most expensive sport the world's ever seen. Ocean racing is unbelievably expensive. He was a son of a grocer. How did he afford, how did he afford ocean racing? Where did that money come from? 
we see George Osborne, don't we? George Osborne was Chancellor of the Exchequer for many years and then he lands a job with BlackRock at £500,000 a year and he's supposed to turn up at least once a week, if they're lucky. What did he do when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, one wonders? What, to, to get that kind of ticket? What kind of deal was struck by Osborne? How did Tony Blair become, you know, a very, not just well-to-do, Tony Blair is a very, very rich man. Where did it all come from? Um, and these people use their political uh, appointments for monetary gain, and they're all at it. They're not nearly all at it. And when you're chucking billions around, uh, when you're talking billions of money uh, for whether it's protective suits for COVID or whatever it happens to be, you're talking billions and billions and billions of pounds. And this has to be signed off with some dealer who's going to manufacture them wherever it happens to be in the Far East or whatever, and he signs it off. And nods as good as a wink to a blind horse, isn't it? Where does the money go? And they will all retire very comfortably. Look at the agricultural minister, Selwyn, whatever his name was, I can't remember. Gummer, Selwyn Gummer. Have a good long look at an aerial photograph of his house, uh, which you can actually find on the internet. I mean, it's film star stuff. This is film star stuff. Swimming pools, acres and acres and acres. On a salary then, he was on of 80 grand as a, as a minister. And nobody asked, do they? When, look, you never get Laura Cheeseburger on the BBC actually interviewing everybody. And she's on 250, what is it, 300 grand a year now uh, out of the public purse. She never says, where'd you get all your money? How come you're so wealthy to any of these people? They're all treated like great, uh, the great and the good, aren't they? What's the latest ticket Gordon Brown's got? He's got, the, he's, I can't remember, he's just been given the latest ticket, I can't remember what it is. <coughs> but it's a big one, it's a big ticket number. It slips it my mind from the mind. This is a man that sold our gold at four, $245 an ounce. <laughs> you know, this is a serious muppet when you're dealing with Gordon Brown. Uh, because he's miserable and Scots, of course, everybody forgives him because they think he must know something we don't know. He must know something we don't know. But he doesn't. He's just another muppet. Uh, so we've now lost, we've lost half our, at least half our gold, uh, our gold reserves. Which brings me on to money, an Austrian school money. What is money? Now, money isn't taught, is it, at schools. Nobody, nobody learnt about money or what money is in the sixth form. <coughs> you know, what is money? You know, good, perhaps you might take the view of uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, I think it was in, 2000, in, in 1912, I think it was, when he said, only gold is money. Only gold is, is money. Uh, and if you look at some of the numbers, that is largely borne out. So, for example, if you take the British economy, if you take the reintroduction of gold, the gold standard, or the sovereign, as it, as it, as it, as it is, the sovereign, um, from 1816 to something like 1905, 1906, there was no inflation. Prices were stable right the way through. From, from 1816, the end of the Napoleon, it was right the way through to 1905, 1906. There was no inflation. We have come to believe, have we not, that inflation is some kind of act of God. Inflation, it, you know, has to happen. There's nothing we can do about it. Uh, but of course, inflation is called by the inflation of money. If you inflate the money supply, uh, you'll see that you will uh, degrade the value of your money. Uh, and when uh, Nixon took uh, America off the gold standard uh, in 1971, uh, and reintroduced the petrodollar, <laughs> which the world fell for. Um, the petrodollar, the spending power of a 1971 dollar now is six cents. I mean, how degraded is that? That's in my lifetime. Well, how old was I? 22 years old when he did that, I think. 22, still playing rugby, boozing, crumpet, you know, the lot. But even I noticed it taken, it taken America off the gold standard. Uh, and of course, it just degrades money, and all the other fiat currencies are degraded with it. Even the Swiss franc, uh, not quite to the extent of the, uh, of the of the Yankee dollar, but it degrades money. It's the hidden tax that you can't see, and people take it for granted. They think that inflation. There's nothing you can do about it. It's an act of God. It's like the weather. It's like the rain falling or lightning, or whatever, whatever it is. They they don't understand these matters. They don't understand these matters. So this is a terrible problem when they actually target inflation. 
without any the Fed or the Bank of England or the Bank of Japan or the ECB actually are trying to get 2% inflation. And everybody goes, oh, right, you know, they're interviewed by these people on TV and all the rest of it and, and financial journalists who aren't worthy of their name, really, they don't think about it. You think, they say, just a minute, what's 2% inflation? 2% inflation. Well, the answer is, do you and your family want prices to go up by 2%? Is that what you want? Is that anybody here want that? Of course you don't want that. You want stable prices. You don't want prices to go up. But they're actually running a system where prices go up. It means that your savings are degraded. Now, who does this not affect? Who does this not affect? Your public sector employee whose pension is index linked. He isn't suffer the draft. It's not a problem. We got that woman, didn't we, that Conservative minister the other day said, oh, if you can't afford the cost of living, if it's going up too much, you just have to work harder or get a better job. And these people don't give a shit, do they? They really don't care. They're dreadful. I can't remember her name, but it'll come to me. Um, I bet she got a bollocking afterwards as well. This is a sort of now tremendous gap that we have between our elected politicians and our bureaucrats and ordinary people in the wealth creating, creating sector. And that's something Austrian school economics would get rid of, which brings us on to what kind of money should we have? Should it be gold backed? Uh, there is no history that I know of where if you accept that paper money was introduced by the Chinese, uh, perhaps in the early Middle Ages, but if you look at money, which has always been gold or silver, that is, J.P. Morgan said, that is, that is money. <coughs> now, people muck about with money. And in the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages, if you were seen clipping coins or adding alloy or all the rest of it, you actually had your hands and feet chopped off, which is uh, a punishment I think would be do well to bring back. Um, it stops people doing it. It stops people doing it. And if you see my speeches in the Parliament, I always said, if we, unless we start hanging some bankers, uh, they're not going to learn their lesson because all they do is disappear to the south of France with their bonus and their knighthood. We need some of them hanging from a lamppost, pausing corrigé les autres for the linguists amongst you. Um, so this really does have to be done and it has to be addressed. And of course, the whole point, the whole reason that we moved off gold uh, uh, as, as, a, as a medium of exchange uh, in the first instance uh, was because moving gold around was difficult and uh, roads are difficult, transport's difficult, uh, all these things are difficult. Much better to have a promissory note uh, that a gold bullion dealer will give on delivery of that, he will pay on demand with that, the value in gold. And of course, uh, nobody here probably can remember, that was actually written on the old big white five pound note when I was a very young man. I promised to pay the bearer on demand the sum in gold. They got rid of that because it wasn't any gold. Um, so uh, this was how it came about. And it didn't take very long. It didn't take very long for people to see how they could fiddle that. And it's being fiddled today. So if you go to your financial advisor or your bank manager and say, I'd like to invest in some gold, he will sell you what is called an ETA, an exchange traded fund. He will send, sell you a certificate, which is an IOU from a bank or a bullion bank. It's an IOU. They don't have any gold. There's no gold there. No, they're physically backed. Say again? They're physically backed. The ETFs, uh, they're physically backed. They're uh, gold and silver. Well, you buy it, but where's the gold, you see? So that then this is, of course, where you find out where the problem is. Uh, the problem is that there are an estimated 500 promissory notes for every piece of gold, which is why they game the system. The gold bullion banks game the system and sell short. They don't have it. With, of course, the compliance of the SEC and all the regulatory authorities on Wall Street and the City of London because it suits them. They don't want people giving up on d dollars and pounds and euros because they're worthless pieces of paper. So they try and suppress the price of gold. But it doesn't work. It can't work and doesn't work forever. For example, I haven't bought one today because in fact I lose it, but I've got a little 
gold sovereign, which I show uh, when I'm uh, sometimes uh, giving these little talks, happens to be a 1905 sovereign. Happens to be 1905. That doesn't mean anything. The point is, the sovereign was the equivalent of, of a pound coin in 1905. It, and of course, it's high quality gold. Now, that would buy you, that gold sovereign in 1905, bed and breakfast in a good hotel in New York, London, Zurich, Paris, or Berlin. That, that, would, that would have bought you. And it will today. It will today if a sovereign's worth it, around about 380 quid, 370 quid as it is today. That will buy you that today. It's not degraded. You go in and uh, you, you can go in and stay in London, a, good, a reasonably good London hotel, bed and breakfast, and that sovereign will pay for it today. Paper, paper pound note won't buy you anything at all. In fact, you wouldn't need to tip the doorman. Be too little to tip the doorman for getting you a cab. So this is the degradation that we have uh, of fiat currency, of paper money. And just winding up on that before we go into Q&A, there's an interesting thing in the covered the, the, the bank charter of 1844, I think it's 1844, um, where the system was changed for banks. If you are a farmer with corn, for example, and you put your corn in a corn hopper, and you pay the guy to look after your corn. Uh, if that corn isn't there when he decides he wants to sell it, that's a criminal offence, and he will go to prison because he's actually stolen your corn. But as soon as you put your money in a bank, and n uh, as Michael <coughs> Caine, if he were here, would say, not a lot of people know that. Uh, if you put that money into a bank under the eighteen, uh, the charter, which is still with us, the banking charter, which is still with us, it becomes the bank's money in law. And their commitment is the promissory note that they give you, which is the, your account, your statement, saying that you've got £100,000 in your account because Granny died, left you £100,000. They're only obliged under Basel III, the new regulatory thing, Basel IV coming in, they're only obliged to keep 10% of that back. They can lend the other uh, 90% called fractional reserve banking. Now, you can get away with that if your assets are watertight. So we saw that sort of thing working fairly well with the old mutuals, like the Leeds Permanent Building Society or the Halifax Building Society, because you had to put 10% in deposit on your own house. You had to put 10% in, they would lend you the balance. But that was in bricks and mortar. Now, what happened with the crash of uh, 90, uh, 20, 2009, what happened then? Well, they were buying monetized debt, trailer park debt, uh, all sorts of politicized uh, debt which hadn't been drilled down. So uh, your assets were degraded. Uh, and that's what happened when you, when you let banks uh, behave in this manner and then run away and escape. And when the, bank, uh, when the CEO of the Royal Bank of Scotland his name has escapes me for the moment, was asked where he was, he was eight billion pounds in the hole. And they asked him where the eight billion pounds had gone to. Some BBC actually got a question right once, you know, where's it gone to? He didn't know. He, he couldn't say. He buggered off. He's still living there in, in luxury today, just buggered off. Uh, and banks do this all the time. And they do it again. And if you think what the debt is today, uh, the overall global debt is 270 trillion. And that includes national debt, uh, private debt, and corporate debt. 270 trillion. There is nobody in this town who can imagine the figure of 270 trillion. It's beyond human imagination. It's monetary infinity. It can't conceivably be ever paid off. It's crippling just financing it, even at low interest rates. It's sucking the lifeblood out of Western economies. And it will probably come up in questions, but I might answer some questions if you've got some questions on Russian sanctions, which is possibly the most suicidal thing even this bunch of Muppets have ever done. Uh, and we can look into that if you so wish. Uh, what time is it now, dear boy? Right, well, shall we go into Q&A and then other stuff comes out and it's always a bit more fun, Q&A, isn't it? Yeah.